Uh, welcome to my talk on uh, the summary of how Google CodeIn and FreeBSD uh, and it FreeBSD's partition in Google CodeIn actually went. Um, I have a small outline. It's basically explaining what uh, Google CodeIn is, and then I'll uh, go a little bit deeper into our actual results. So for those of you who don't know what Google CodeIn is, is a uh, obviously by a Google-initiated uh, um, contest to engage pre-university students in open source and other engineering uh, areas, but uh, we'll focus on open source because we are um, in that area. So it's a, a contest that runs um, from like November till December, or no, from, sorry, from November till January, and uh, in the middle of that, we, uh, as a open source, project, we need to supply more tasks. I will go a little bit um, more into tasks uh, in a minute. Um, so what is Google Coding actually supposed to do? It should help open source projects getting new contributors, committers, and people who can help out. And the idea is to get uh, pre-university students, so people like in the age group from like 13 to 17 can participate. And uh, it's a um, a kind of a different idea behind, rather than uh, having a Google Summer of Code, it's a, a different uh, audience for that. And um, what you do as an open source project is you put out tasks, 40 as a minimum, and then you uh, give these tasks a uh, priority, like or a, a difficulty rating, like easy, medium, and hard, and then students can request to work on such a task. So each student can only work on one task at a time. And once they um, finish this task, they get points for this task. I will go into pointing or at this, in this point later on. Um, what's in it for the students? They can win a, uh, a trip to the Google HQ in Mountain View, California. And the, uh, the mentors or the participating you know, you know, mentors um, get T-shirt, so there's no monetary um, reward for the pro uh, for the uh, projects, rather than in Google Code in uh, Google Code uh, Google Summer of Code, where they uh, get you know um, what's it like five thousand no five hundred euros dollars yeah um, so this is a, a small comparison chart. This is not to say that one is uh, better than the other. It's just to get the uh, point across what, what the actual difference is. So for Google Summer of Code, you need to be at least 18 years old, and Google Coding is uh, targeted for a lower age group. And as probably most of you know, Google Summer of Code is about um, open source projects putting out tasks and one uh, it's bigger tasks, and these uh, one big project that you are working on over the whole project runtime. In Google Coding, it's different. You pick multiple tasks, and you work on multiple tasks as much as you can, because you need the points to actually win in this contest. And you usually have one to two mentors. And um, since in Google Coding, each task has a different mentor, you have like over the whole contest period different mentors. Uh, the turnaround time is also a little bit slower on, in Summer of Code. And in Google Coding, it's um, intended to be much faster. So a task should be finished rather quick. And uh, also the, the response from the mentors should also be much, much faster so that students don't waste time that they could use for actually uh, working on these tasks. Uh, criteria for success is rather obvious. You know, in Google, some of code, the project needs to be finished. and. Uh, in Google Coding, the small tasks that the uh, projects put out also need to be finished. And that's the responsibility of the mentor. So they decide whether the task is actually finished or does need some work afterwards. And uh, one of the biggest differencing, differentiating factors is that um, in Google Summer of Code, as the name suggests, it's mostly or like exclusively about programming and software development. And uh, what's a appealing to us, or for me at least, is that in Google Code and there is a much wider variety of task types. So we have stuff like code. Code is a little bit um, 
uh, should be viewed with a different uh, mindset because since these students are like not 18 yet, they cannot, um, it's, it's a copywriting thing, so they cannot uh, gain copyright of the code that they contribute. So the contributions that they make in the code category are not that, not that big. So Google Code in is, you can contribute code in Google Code in, but it's not uh, such, it cannot be such big ones that uh, has actually big copyright issues associated with it. So that's uh, better done in Summer of Code. Uh, documentation is a, is a big one and was a big one in our uh, last year summer of code. Uh, another category is outreach. So outreach is everything that's basically uh, marketing, how you promote the projects, anything that you uh, do to get the project known to a wider audience. Quality assurance, finding and fixing bugs and um, getting, you know, increase the code quality or what have you. Research is like um, the project gives you uh, a problem and you need to do some research and find possible or proposed possible solutions. Training, create training materials like uh, cheat sheets or uh, do actual uh, e-learning videos, small instruction videos. Uh, translation, I, I don't think I need to explain that much. And uh, user interface tweaks, um, that's probably not much uh, for FreeBSD, but uh, I think if you, are, if you have an open source project that's, that's GUI based, then uh, there are probably a number of tasks that you can create in that category. So for me, Google Summer of Code is as uh, value as Google Code in, and they shouldn't be viewed as, uh, you know, competing projects. They should be viewed as uh, projects that can that have different um, you know, target audience, and that um, both are beneficial to the project as a whole. So what do you need to do if you want to participate in Google Code In? Uh, first of all, you need to create a list of 40 high quality tasks. And that was a big problem when we uh, uh, started participating or wanted to participate in that because we had, at that time, we had no tasks at all. So what I did, I went through our wiki page and listed stuff that I thought would be good tasks. And the tasks need to be um, small and granular so that students don't need the whole uh, contest period to work on them. So they need to be rather small and um, like uh, typo fixes or they could uh, do some converting of a wiki page into an actual article. That's stuff that I wanted to have uh, students done. And uh, so I basically wrote up a list of uh, like 30 or 35 tasks and others contributed also some nice tasks. And the interesting thing is that the tasks that I thought were important and were actually really easy were, were the tasks that didn't get finished by the end of the contest. So I thought I did put out easy tasks and students picked other tasks. So anyway. Um, then you rate these tasks. So if you have a task that requires documentation and it's just simple uh, typo fixing, then you rate it with a, as a task type that is easy. So easy gets you one point. If you finish a task type easy, you get one point in the overall uh, Google Code and scoring. And uh, you can also have um, tasks that have a medium difficulty, and then you get two points. And tasks that are actually hard are uh, uh, will give you uh, four points. So um, you can do this as a student, uh, like with a strategy, you can say, okay, I only work on hard tasks. You need more time for these, but you get higher points. But you can also do uh, only easy tasks. You need to do more of these, but you can collect points quicker. And then what you also need to do as a project, you need to assign people who know, who are knowledgeable in that area who can help students when they have questions in these tasks. So uh, we had a talk with uh, a task that had uh, the conversion from, uh, when I look at Beat, I see a, a Myth TV and a VirtualBox. And uh, that was one of the tasks that we needed some people who have expertise in that area. So we need, uh, so we had people uh, sign up as mentors for these tasks specifically. And then, during the contest, you also um, need to do some stuff. You need to mostly answer claims from students to work on a task. So Google put up a, uh, it 
uh, menage.google.com. It's similar probably to Google uh, Summer of Code. It's uh, basically a, a system where you can log in and say, ah, this student has just claimed this task, and, or this, this one task, and uh, then you can say as a mentor, okay, I assign this task exclusively to this student so that the student can work on this task and get the points if it uh, finishes. And uh, you need to give feedback and help, so there is a, uh, a system there that you can, where you can post questions. The problem with that is that, the, that it's not actually linked to your email address, or I don't, didn't, it didn't get any email uh, when the students re responded to any of those tasks. So I needed to log in to Google uh, Codeim uh, project each time, and I, you know, uh, is there any response to any of my tasks? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah, it could be a spammy application, yeah. <laughs> okay, and then now your, in, your inbox is exploding. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's not so good, yeah. Okay, maybe they learn from that. Um, most uh, stuff that students uh, ask is um, basically on the task itself. So uh, Google warned us in, a, in advance that since these students are so young, they may have um, like excessive uh, you know, exclamation marks in their postings or they only post with like uh, caps lock uh, turned on all the time. But from, our, from, or from my experience at least, that wasn't the case. Most students were actually, they posted good questions and they were very thoughtful and um, were very, uh, sometimes they were really shy, oh, uh, please, I need to uh, know this certain thing, and can you explain it to me, please? And I think that was a, a good kind of combination that we were giving help to them, and they could ask us anytime. We also had set up uh, an IRC channel. We used the channel that for Google Summer of Code because that wasn't running at the time, so we could use that. And a stu some of the students logged into that and asked questions directly over IRC. And um, then it's the case that students submit work, and then you, as a mentor, need to check the work, whether it fits your requirements. So sometimes students submit something, and they think it's uh, the thing that the, that the project wants, but if you, if, uh, like it's a, it's a documentation uh, fix, then you see, oh, it has excessive white space. Then you can say, ah, okay, the student um, is, is new to this, and but he did the, the general uh, Converting of the actual document, he did the, the content change, and we say, okay, it's fine enough. We can fix the white space afterwards. So that's that shouldn't be the, the problem that the student should uh, have too much time on it. Please. Uh, and during half of the contest time, you need to provide another faulty task. You wouldn't imagine how many tasks get worked on and actually fixed by students who are actually very engaged in these kind of things. So you need to provide another 40 tasks. And we went through our wiki again, and we were trying, ah, could this be a Google Codein task? And uh, we also had some kind of tasks that would uh, depend upon each other. So uh, what one of our developers um, suggested was that we had a kind of FreeBSD community portal. And he did some tasks uh, like create the basic database, and then create a basic uh, web page for it, and then um, code the actual authentication to the, on that web page, so it kind of a build upon each other. So uh, some of these tasks were worked on, but it's more difficult if you have stuff that uh, you need to build on that is based on another task. And so I, I try to make tasks as atomic as possible so that if you fix one thing, then this whole task is finished. So what is... Uh, the actual experience from, or from our first uh, participation in that contest to actually increase the, the number of tasks. Because we as a project, we want also students that they finish many tasks and then we should make it as easy as possible for them. So um, one thing that you need to remember is that most students have little or no experience in open source work. They might have heard of the project, they might have not. They might know something about the project, they might be using the software itself but they also might just wander in and they just were just looking um, a task to solve because they can work not only on one specific task list from one 
Google Code in participating uh, pro open source program, but they can they get a list of all participants, so they can do jobs from uh, FreeBSD, they can do jobs from or tasks from uh, what did also participate? I think uh, uh, video LAN, the video LAN client or uh, LibreOffice. So they could pick and choose from every pro participating project. Um, the surprising thing is that once the student get to know the project, they come again and fix other stuff, other tasks that the project put up. So when they get to know the actual uh, workflow, then they uh, will probably or most likely will come again and fix other tasks that the project put up. Um, as I said, we need to, or well, from my experience, it, it's easier for students if the task is easy and as granular as possible. And if you put up a task, you need to explain every single bit. You need to explain even the most obvious thing. And the more explanation you will do, the more likely it is that this task gets picked by someone and gets actually finished. And uh, if you have a, a big task that might be too big for one student to swallow, then you should probably put it into uh, many smaller tasks so that the chance is bigger that multiple students work on this in parallel and you, then basically you can put it together afterwards in one, like let students work on a big document that might be too big to, for one person, then you split it up into smaller sections, put it in separate tasks, and then put it together afterwards once they submitted the, the patches. Uh, one other thing is um, that you might not have think about, thought about it is that you can reopen a task again. So the student has submitted a solution to this task and you can say, oh, okay, yeah, it's good enough, but let's see what another student might come up with. So we had a, a a uh, number of artwork tasks where students should create posters or uh, cheat sheets, and we reopened those because we wanted to have more results from students. So another student might have different ideas how to design these. So we had a, a number of uh, nice cheat sheets cr created or posters, and these are relatively easy because then you have a collection of uh, like posters that were generated, and you can you have the luxury of picking uh, from the ones that were submitted. And um, as a mentor, you need to be much quicker in providing feedback. So the students actually don't want to waste time waiting for you to answer. They want to get on the next task. Or they want to rework the task if you say the task is not good enough to be uh, awarding the points for it. And uh, don't be afraid to provide bad feedback as well. So if you say to a student, ah, this is not good enough, we have, uh, you might need to look up our like, documentation uh, rules again or you need to um, fix those typos that you did in this, in this document, something like that. You need to provide feedback. And most students will actually see that um, this is valuable to them, and they will fix it and resubmit it again. On the other hand, you don't need to, uh, or you shouldn't expect perfectness. These are still students. They are still learning. They are they're getting their first experiences with open source work, and then there is stuff that you can fix afterwards that's relatively easy rather than you doing the whole task. So let the students do most of the, day, the basic dirty work, and then you can do the finishing touches afterwards on it. So what are the actual results? I put up here a small uh, graphic to show which kind of tasks from our AD task were actually finished. So 96%. Most of these were from the documentation category. And um, I hope we have, when we participate next time, we have a little more variety. So maybe we have some ports task or source tasks, if that is possible. So if there is a software that is easily portable, but no one has had the time yet to, uh, to port that, maybe you should put up a ports task. Um, we had like uh, some of them who were still open, so no one, no student actually claimed those tasks. So they were still open after the contest, and we might reuse those as well. Or we need to look up what actual task descriptions were in there. Maybe they were not clear enough, so no one uh, claimed these. Uh, these are the tasks that were reopened and didn't uh, get finished by the end of the contest. And uh, the red ones are the ones that were unapproved. So a student claimed these, like in the last day of the contest, and no mentor actually approved that the students uh, finished that work. 
And uh, there was 1% of a task that was actually claimed by a student, but no mentor actually uh, assigned it to the student. So I think that's a relatively good uh, chart from the results. And I uh, think since it's our first participation in that, overall, I'm, I'm very uh, happy and satisfied with, uh, with the results that a student have uh, submitted. So I've put up some, some highlights. I don't uh, have all in my slides, because then it would blow up the talk, the talk a little bit more. Uh, we have two FreeBSD wall papers that were created by students that are kind of nice. We have two new cheat sheets. I talked about this yesterday, that we could use these in our uh, actual official documentation as a maintained document, so that uh, if there is a trade show or here in the, uh, in the floor, they could put out these cheat sheets for people to pick them up. and. Um, it gets them started, or they can look up some certain commands that are maybe not that uh, easy. So the, the ports cheat sheet is kind of nice. It has basically anything except uh, package ng stuff, but uh, like package add, package delete, and um, some uh, options that explained in there. Uh, there was also a new uh, FreeBSD front page graphics layout as, um, proposed. We put that task out to just to see what, what the students would make out of it. It's, um, it's nice, but it uh, won't replace the FreeBSD website next week, so uh, don't be scared. It, it's still, a, it's an approach. We, we had a look at it, and uh, it had some nice elements, but it wasn't perfectly enough to, to be actually uh, useful. But we get some ideas from it, and maybe we will use parts of it in our uh, maybe new redesign of the web page. Uh, there was a promotional video created. It's, um, you, you, if you look at it, it's still uh, student quality. You need that, to have that in mind when you, when you watch it. It's basically um, a system administrator waking up, and uh, at one time it's a Windows system administrator, and next time it's a FreeBSD system administrator. And uh, you know, the, the result is that uh, you know, with FreeBSD, you can uh, get to sleep after like five minutes, and the Windows admin has to get up and run into the server room or something. Um, another thing was that some poster templates were created, and uh, we could put them up again. Just need to increase the, the, the year, and we uh, have some posters that we can uh, put up in places to get students interested. And there was a screencast generated for the new FreeBSD 9 installer, which kind of uh, is, is nice because it, it walks you through the whole installation process and gives you some pointers where you need to be aware of certain things. And I thought that was kind of nice. It has like a, an Indian accent, but um, oh well, it's good enough. I think it's nice because it's on, it's on YouTube. I, I didn't put up the uh, URL yet. But um, you know, you don't know what might come of it. Some people might watch it and get interested in FreeBSD, and then they know how to install it. And well, we'll see. Um, we had many tasks from documentation categories, so I'll focus on these here. Um, we had many wiki pages in the FreeBSD wiki that we wanted to have in our official documentation because you people took much effort in updating them and we want to have them in our, our official documentation. So we put up many tasks like SGMLIs this wiki page. And uh, many people did that, many students. And now we have much new stuff in our documentation. So the developer's handbook got a new info on the source tinderbox. We have more stuff in the Porter's Handbook, um, like meta variables, uh, Linuxism that you need to be, to be aware of, uh, description of the moved file, the new license infrastructure. And um, the FreeBSD Handbook got most of the updates, because these updates are uh, not only typo fixes, but also new additions, like um, the uh, MythTV chapter that's completely new. Uh, we had some nice uh, updates from the uh, yeah, virtual box instructions. Uh, Bernhard Fröhlich wrote me yesterday that he updated the wiki again, so now I need to update that task as well. But um, it's nice because it's, it gives us more stuff that we can work on. And uh, students submit stuff that we just need to submit into or just commit into the actual documentation repository. And that's much, much easier for us than rather than writing that stuff again or writing as ourselves. Quota and reservation uh, description for ZFS, which is also kind of nice because the examples are pretty, pretty nice. And uh, we have uh, file system support for 
you know, RISOFS, XFS, and X2FS. These are the ones that aren't yet in the documentation because they need some little work, um, like white space fixes or some wording changes, but we try to bring them in as well because they are uh, good enough to be uh, in the documentation. So a number of uh, tasks that we need to do. And um, this is my actual summary of the whole experience. Uh, we had, I think it's a very good result what we get from it. It was our first time it might crash and burn, but it didn't. And it was very good because many of our tasks got actual resolvement and student had also gained an insight of how the FreeBSD project does its work. And uh, as a direct result, we had a new committer in our ranks, which is Isabel Long, because she worked on many of those documentation tasks, and so she sub subsequently was punished with a documentation bit. So that's the actual best outcome of the whole. If we can multiply that by like 10 people for each time the, the contest runs, then you have to declare victory. Um, Certainly, we'll try to participate again next year, which means that we need to create tasks again. So we probably col should collect them over the whole year. In the uh, We have a wiki page for Google Code in. And um, I want to spread the tasks out not only into the documentation area, but over all of the other categories, like outreach and code and um, you know translation. All that stuff is valuable to us, and students can work on that. Um, for each task, we need mentors, of course. So if you have a little spare time to work on these tasks or answer questions from students when the contest runs, so please think about this or think about doing tasks that you would like to have get finished. And then you can mentor those and see, oh, whether the students can uh, finish those instead of you. You can still commit it. That's the easiest part of it. Um, prioritization is not too difficult. You can uh, probably guess how much time it would take to f for a student to finish that. Like take your time and multiply it by two or three and then that's a good time frame to, to guess. Um, and yeah, the, the overall goal for us is to attract more students to become actual contributors or committers. So even after the contest, these people should still help us update our project do stuff for the project, give us some help, even if it's just small bits. The students don't need just to work on the contest and the tasks. They should be motivated to work on the project as a whole, even after the contest is over. So I want to thank a few people. Um, I don't know how to pronounce his name, so I'll just. Uh... OK, yeah, thanks. I'll try to. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Sorry, yeah, it's, it's Polish, right? <laughs> I got voice check, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did. Uh, basically, he had the idea that FreeBSD should participate. He asked Core for it. Core said, yeah, we could do that if you uh, put up enough tasks. Uh, I didn't know about this, so he approached me. Could you, like, create 40 tasks for Google Code? And I was like, okay, let's see. Um, he did motivate the whole thing. He tried to recruit as many mentors as possible. And he also uh, provided virtual machine images because most students didn't have a free BSD system. So they, when they need to work on a documentation task, they need to download the system, install it, download the actual documentation stuff, and then, can, then, then they can work on the actual task. And that's difficult because it takes much more time than just having a VM that has everything prepared for it and where you can just start it and, and work on the task right away. Uh, Gavin, who is sitting here, is also uh, was very good in helping increase uh, the, these, uh, the quality of these virtual machines because he did much more uh, out, uh, updated stuff in there and uh, he put an, uh, an updated documentation tree in there and do, did some tools also. For, for work on the documentation. Yeah, yeah. So that's that was probably very helpful to students, and that's probably the reason why so many tasks in documentation area got fixed. And I want to thank all the mentors who took up a task, even if it was just one, uh, because the students needed some help in these tasks. And 
if you cannot help the student, then the student will drop the task back into the pool and um, then it isn't resolved at the end. And of course, thanks to all the students. None is here, of course, uh, unfortunately, but um, yeah, I want to thank them for working on our tasks and I hope they will uh, work on them again when we put up our next contest. So are there any questions from you? That's why we're doing this. Yeah. So I mean, I suppose that you have uh, the results from that trip uh, on your notes to see sort of how many pages you had in your life to be on the day of the time frame and everything. And so you just mentor and train. And I'm not sure that I will uh, put in all that extra much effort and supervise them and how I'm uh, yeah. doing to, to do the work. But if you then get the people on board with the motivation, which is now two thirds of the way through writing a set of 46 manuals. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the whole thing. And it's probably easier for, for, for high school students to actually find typos rather than, you know, come up with a new, like, virtual memory subsystem. That's probably a little bit more difficult. But it's, some, it's a start that you can do in an open source project, and then you can wait, work your way from there. So we'll take them by the hand as much as we can and then try to guide them into becoming committers, hopefully, in the future. Yeah. <laughs> You're all laughing a knowing laugh, yeah. Yeah. So if you get them involved then and then we solve the job, we their introductory year and hopefully Yeah. And who knows, maybe some of them will ought to actually work on Google Summer of Code as well. So once they get to know the project a little bit better from the you know, from the inside and how nice the the people are that are working on it, then they are hooked, and then, you know, we have more people, and that's, we, we need more people. It's too much stuff is undone, who hasn't any, any, any not, not just in documentation, but also in, in other areas. So the more people we can attract, the better it gets. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I hope I'm not running over time, so I'll finish here. Thanks for listening.